Thank you, Grisel. Buenos dias. My name is Rudy Yanez, and I serve here as the OLAS advisor. I'm also the student life coordinator here at Northern Community College. As a new member of the OLAS family, I am proud to learn of the rich history that it embodies, and our team is dedicated to building on the foundation that you have laid out for us. So we thank you for that. Before I introduce this morning's keynote speaker, I would like to acknowledge our Latino Heritage Month sponsors. So please join me in thanking them and I will, as I go off the list of them. I would like to thank the President's Office, the Office of Student Life, the Office of Admissions and Recruitment, the Multicultural and Global Initiatives Committee, the Renner Academic Library, Columbia College at Elgin, the Organization of Latin American Students, our College Programming Board, and Sammy's Mexican Grill. We thank them for sponsoring our events for the month. I would also like to thank our student MCs, our volunteers, and our planning committee members. Can all of our volunteers, committee members, please stand and be acknowledged so that everybody can see what a wonderful team we've been working with. Without these people, the success of this event would not be happening. We truly thank them for their tireless preparation and hard work that has gone into planning all of our month events. We thank them. Finally, I would like to make an invitation to all of you to some of our upcoming Latino Heritage Month events. At each seat, there is a program that we have listed all of our events, upcoming events for the month celebrations. And all of the events have the details and descriptions on that program. These are events that are free and open to the public unless they're otherwise noted. Uh, now, please help me in welcoming our keynote speaker. He is a progressive leader who has fought to improve the lives of all people in Illinois. He currently serves as the commissioner for the 7th District of the Cook County Commissioning, Commissioner's Board. He emigrated from Durango, Mexico to Chicago at the age of 10. His early commitment to equity led him to work as a paralegal and community organizer in the Pilsen and Little Village neighborhoods of Chicago. In 1986, he was elected alderman to the Chicago City Council from the 22nd Ward. In 1992, he ran for the Illinois State Senate and became the first Mexican-American elected. Let me say that one more time. He became the first Mexican-American elected to the State Senate. After serving two terms, he left the Senate to start in Lassa, Chicago, formerly Little Village Community Development Corporation. He grew the organization from one employee, which was himself, to 27 full-time employees, 120 part-time workers, and an annual budget of 2.9 million. In 2010, he returned to public office by successfully running for Cook County Commissioner. He was re-elected to his second term in 2014. In 2015, he ran for mayor of Chicago and, first, and forced the first ever runoff election in the city's history. Yeah. He received many distinctions for his tireless advocacy for social justice and has served on the boards of several organizations. He holds a BA in political science, a master's degree in urban planning from the University of Illinois Chicago. He and his wife Evelyn reside in Chicago's Little Village neighborhood. They have three adult children, Jesus, Samuel, and Rosa. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and welcome Mr. Jesus to the city. Buenos dias, and good morning to all of you. Uh, my assistant here has been bugging me about posing for a serious picture, so I'm going to give him a serious picture. <laughs> now that we have the serious business uh, conducted, uh, we will proceed. I have to tell you, I am super delighted uh, to be here with the Elgin Community uh, College uh, family. Uh, all of the representatives that are here, uh, especially all of the electeds. I had the chance to converse with uh, Mayor Captain uh, before he had to depart. Uh, he has a busy uh, schedule today. I want to thank all the elected officials who are here, uh, members of the City Council, the Kane County Board members, uh, state representatives, everyone else uh, that holds elective office, and of course the trustees of Elgin Community College. We must be nice to them. 
uh, because they're being nice to our community. So thank you for the wonderful event. And you know, this morning is of course very celebratory because we're celebrating two anniversaries in fact. And I, I, I inquired about it because this is important stuff to me. Given my background in student activism and community organizing, I said, is this both the 25th Hispanic Heritage Breakfast and the 25th anniversary of the creation of the organization of, of Latin American students? And it is, so it's a double celebration. How about a round of applause for a double? Yes. <clears throat> and of course, uh, it's wonderful to be with you for the kickoff of Family Day. I just wish that people like Donald Trump and some of the other presidential aspirants could be here so that they could see what our community is contributing in Elgin throughout the state of Illinois, and they could see all of our friends who have gathered here to celebrate our essence, our history, and our contributions to this land that we call America. It's great to be here. I hope he gets a clip of today's gathering. <laughs> so thank you, uh, Rudy, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you for keeping it short. And of course, I also much appreciate the work that you do in uh, student life, helping students get here, graduate from here, and go on to other institutions of higher learning and excel in their respective professions and careers uh, that they uh, pursue. So today, uh, we kick off Elgin Community College's Hispanic Heritage Month, and it brings me, of course, great pleasure to be with you uh, on Family Day, El Dia de la Familia. Although today is a date when many families suffered tremendous losses during the September 11th attacks, it has also become a day to celebrate family and to celebrate the efforts that those families have made in order for us to be here and to achieve one of the greatest accomplishments. And that is obtaining a higher education. As we celebrate the effort of parents and students during this month, it is fitting that we pay homage and show our gratitude to a watershed moment in the struggle of Latinos to ensure access to public education. What am I talking about? There's one person here that I'm sure knows what I'm talking about, and that's, of course, Judge Barbosa, and probably Jane and the Barbosa family. Uh, they are probably the first residents of Elgin that I came to know, to work with, to collaborate, and I'm delighted that they could be here this morning. This is my second time at Elgin Community College. But I'd like to share with you the story of a gentleman whose name is Gonzalo Mendez, a Latino parent who stood up for his children. In the early 1940s, Mendez, a Mexican-American, uh, had been running a small coffee shop in Santana, Santa Ana, for some of you, California, which he opened with his savings after working as an orange picker for many years, pursuing the American dream. It was a difficult time, though. We were in the middle of a Second World War, and the United States government had been engaging in the terrible practice of the internment of Japanese and Japanese Americans uh, citizens. One of those individuals placed under internment was a friend of Gonzalo's and, and was also the owner of a tract of land that was used for orange crops. When Gonzalo's friend was incarcerated in one of those internment camps, he decided to look after the land, relying on his experience as an orange picker, he moved his family into Orange County, California, to manage the business. Running an orange crop is no easy task, so Gonzalo asked his sister and her husband of French ascendancy to help him run the farm. In 1944, as the two families settled into farm life, Gonzalo knew the importance of an education and asked his sister to take his two children and her two children to the local school and enroll them for the upcoming school year. Less than an hour later, Gonzalo's sister returned with all four kids. 
He was surprised to hear, Gonzalo was, that the school would only enroll his sister's daughters because they were light-skinned and had their father's last name, the French fellow, whose last name was Vidalry. The school administrator directed Gonzalo's kids to enroll at the segregated Hoover Elementary, also known as the Mexican School. A very level-headed Gonzalo went to the 17th Street School that had denied his children and said, there must be some mistake. My children are American citizens and speak fluent English. Without other recourse, Gonzalo left the school with the intention of changing the practice of segregating Mexican school children in California. After weeks of searching for help, Gonzalo learned of a Jewish lawyer, told you we had a lot of allies, named <laughs> David Marcus, who was married to a Mexican woman, and they had two children together. In an earlier lawsuit, Marcus had successfully sued his municipality and won. He had argued in that earlier suit that exclusion from local public swimming pool was a discriminatory act practice against Mexicans and Mexican Americans. With lawyer in hand, Gonzalo then spent 18 months convincing 19 other families to join him and his, fam and his family in a class action lawsuit against the, dis the school district. If you're wondering about the orange farm, Gonzalo left it in the care of his wife, Felicitas. Originally from Puerto Rico, Fel see, coalition builder. <laughs> Felicitas was also heavily, as am I, by the way, was, was also heavily invested in ensuring that her children were given an equal opportunity and volunteered to manage the business with the help of Gonzalo's sister and husband. With 20 families on board, each one sent their children to the witness stand, and each of the children in fluent English expressed their disappointment of being sent to the segregated school. Two issues were raised during the trial. The first was that the children's rights under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment were being violated. And the second issue was that the separate but equal ruling in Plessy versus Ferguson was unconstitutional. The case garnered national attention and the NAACP, under the leadership of Thurgood Marshall, who by the way became the first African American to serve on the US Supreme Court later in life, wrote an amicus brief in support of the 20 Mexican families. The court ruled in favor of the 20 families as it pertained to the equal protection claim. However, did not rule on the separate but equal issue. Fortunately though, the Mendez case served as precedent that would be useful in the NAACP eight years later in that case in the historic Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas case in 1954. That decision desegregated schools at the national level. Latino heritage and our struggle has run parallel with the struggle of other minorities seeking equal access to education. So 20 families were able to desegregate schools in California. Imagine what is possible. Imagine. You know, though, the part of the Mendez story that made me think the most was the fact that Mendez's third child, who was born years after the 1946 decision, did not know about the case until she was a college student. Get this, she was a college student in Southern California and took a Latino studies course where she read for the first time the Mendez versus Westminster School District case. Astounded, she called mama. <laughs> she called her Puerto Rican mother, Felicitas, because Gonzalo had already passed away by this time and asked, mom, why didn't you tell me? Felicitas answered, we did it all, we did all of it so that you would never have to worry about it. Keeping good things quiet, right? The whole story and the Mendes' approach made me realize that maybe we're not vocal enough about our experiences. We need to share more and talk more about our history, especially when it relates to education, our struggles, and more importantly, our victories. So please indulge me in a few more minutes of your time 
by allowing me to tell you a little bit about my struggles and some of my victories. But let me be clear on what I mean by victories, because although I've experienced personal victories, I have also witnessed other victories, and I also celebrate those as my own. And so should you. The courage displayed by the Mendez family inspired me to get involved and to speak out to create positive change. It motivated me to become a paralegal where I work as an immigrant advocate. I'm proud to say that as I help parents with their immigration issues with Judge Barbosa back then, I also supported and advocated for children in the little village and Pilsen communities in Chicago when they were being denied the right to enrollment at local schools, late 70s and early 80s, mind you. I also lobbied against anti-immigrant legislation in Springfield. That was a daunting experience and one that stayed with me for a long time. Latinos were approaching 14% of the population at that time, and we were powerless in Springfield. We had no elected officials in the state legislature, not one. I became determined to make a change for the better. I was young, though, so I chose to crawl first, run later. That's a pun, by the way. I started organizing as a student activist at the University of Illinois at Chicago. With the help of others, we founded a Mexicano and Chicano student organization. That's why, of course, I'm very fond of olas and people who become activists and become active in uh, campus life. Like the olas organization here at Elgin Community College. We pressured the university to be intentional about embracing the Latino community to open its doors, not just by admitting more Latinos and Latinas, but by retaining them through the right support services, such as those that Rudy Yanez implements here at Elgin Community College. And through direct action, sometimes you've got to engage in direct action and civil disobedience, we force the University of Illinois at Chicago to create the Latino Cultural Center when I was a student there. I then moved on to make plans to get Latinos elected to the city council in Chicago and the state legislature. It was a dynamic time. There was a Southside congressman by the name of Harold Washington that had learned about politics and had benefited and practiced machine politics and worked with machine politicians. But Harold, too, wanted more for his community. And there were many others, including myself, that felt the same. We were now poised to make our mark in municipal and state elections. But truth be told, there were many challenges and hurdles. Chicago had been dominated for many years by the Chicago political machine. They had managed to concentrate all political power in the hands of a few privileged power brokers. This resulted in a political system that perpetuated corruption, patronage, nepotism, and excluded racial minorities and women who are the majority of the population. It was intimidating, and it made organizing our community difficult. We were not accustomed to the brass knuckle politics of the time, and taking it to the streets was tougher than we thought. Luckily, young people know the streets best, and at that time, believe it or not, I was very young, and the fervor by black and brown minorities to become politically empowered made us unafraid. In our fight to elect Latinos to the city council, my best friend and mentor, Rudy Lozano, who had been a member of the OLAS organization at the U of I, ran for alderman in our little village ward. He was 31 years old. He was my compadre. I was his campaign manager. I was wet behind the ears. We lost that election by 17 votes. Three months later, he was brutally assassinated in his home. We grieved the loss of our friend, while at the same time realized that we had built something special. This shocking act, the assassination of Rudy Lozano, frightened us. It made us speculate and wonder whether it was opponents, those opposed to immigrant workers becoming organized, members of the underworld, was legendary in Chicago at that time, or other political opponents in the Chicago machine. I was forced to carry the baton, and when I say forced, I mean forced. I had to make some very personal sacrifices. 
The younger element in the, roo in the room can probably identify. I like being off cameras. I like being behind the scenes. I had to give up things that were very near and dear to me as a young man. I'm sure many of you can relate. I had to trim off my Vicente Fernandez Uli Colon sideburns. <laughs> I had big pork chops, Father Jesus. I also had to part ways with my Santana-esque afro, big one that I had, <laughs> and my goatee, and yes, even put aside some of my revolutionary speak. The following year, I ran for a Democratic leadership position, and at the age of 27, won that election by 59 votes, a landslide, when you compare it to the 17 that we lost by the prior year. <laughs> this was a huge pendulum swing, as two years later, we used the federal courts to advance our cause through the Voting Rights Act. We achieved the victory that resulted in the ward maps being redrawn in Chicago, because African Americans and Latinos showed that they were being discriminated against. This helped level the playing field. I was then elected alderman to the city council along with three other Latinos. Things were changing and about to get better through political engagement. As a member of the Chicago City Council and under the leadership of Harold Washington, Chicago government became one of the most diverse in the country. Latinos were appointed to key departments, boards, and commissions. Harold, Washington that is, had established the Mayor's Advisory Commission on Latino Affairs and named a Cuban woman to lead it. The city started embracing immigrants. We were no longer cooperating with immigration officials and we had put an end to the harassment of immigrants in Chicago. Soon after, more Latinos were elected to the Chicago City Council and the state legislature. Government was also moving towards an equitable distribution of jobs and services as well as contracts. I eventually moved on to be the first Mexican American elected to the Illinois Senate. It was a fascinating time. I carried bills and uh, became very involved in promoting the rights of immigrants, furthering public education, workers' rights, health care. As a matter of fact, I championed the enactment of the Language Assistance Act, which provides services to uh, limited English uh, immigrants as well as people who are uh, hearing impaired at hospitals throughout Illinois. Matter of fact, I had another rare opportunity. Have you heard of a fellow by the name of Barack Obama? <laughs> Thought it would be familiar. Well, I helped break the guy in. I was in the Illinois Senate when he arrived. I taught him what to do, what not to do. He took some of my advice, but mostly not, and look where <laughs> it got him. Still, I claim some credit for his success. But we also face new challenges, and I'll briefly mention them because they happen, but I will not dwell on them because I came here with the purpose of sharing a message of solidarity and celebration of Hispanic heritage. In 1998, I suffered my first political loss. I lost my Senate seat at the height of my popularity. I could run through many reasons why it happened, but essentially, City Hall and the reorganized machine in Chicago put a massive army on the street and spent huge amounts of money under the guises of a newly created entity called the Hispanic Democratic Organization. It was really a patronage army controlled by the fifth floor, so don't be fooled by names every time you see them. Returning to Little Village, to my nonprofit sector work, doing community organizing and community development, I was happy. I also took advantage of the free time to earn a master's degree in urban planning from the University of Illinois. I could go on and tell you about that part of my life, but that will take another half hour. So let me move into my comeback to politics. In 2010, I ran for a Cook County Commissioner. This time, it was a real landslide as I beat a 16-year incumbent. I had spent 12 years out of politics, but unknown to many foes, I had also spent time nurturing old relationships and building new ones. I never looked back. I didn't miss politics, never thought I would run for office again. It felt good to be back, though. But upon my return to elected office, I was faced with 
budgetary crisis, a government known for corruption and inefficiency, and many of the strides that we had made previously made in protecting immigrants were being affected by new federal policy, given the inaction and comprehensive immigration reform of the federal government. A policy that expected local government to turn over undocumented individuals to Immigration and Customs Enforcement, also known as ICE, which was destroying families because of deportations that occurred as a result of the policy. It created distrust between police departments and immigrant communities throughout the metropolitan area, and most importantly, it was unconstitutional, and the county was paying liability lawsuits as a result of that practice. I soon realized that there was still much to do. In 2011, I passed an ordinance that became one of my proudest achievements, the ICE Detention Policy Ordinance. It protects the rights of all residents in Cook County, including the undocumented. Over 350 municipalities, counties, and states across the U.S. have followed our lead, which essentially rests upon the principle that you cannot hold people in detention in county jails without probable cause. It's a constitutional uh, promise that uh, is made real in Cook County. Cook County is one of the best turnaround stories in government anywhere in the country. We've made headway in criminal justice, uh, reform in health care to all, and ensuring that Cook County is a place where we, what was wrong with it, we corrected it, and we make it work for everyone. In October of 2014, I was heading to a re-election as a county commissioner, minding my own business, and for the first time in my life, running unopposed. I had already won, won the primary election in a very democratic district, so I was assured of uh, my reelection. And then the mayoral election was approaching. A person who was going to run for mayor uh, took a turn in terms of uh, her health for the worst, and she was unable to run. She called me and asked me if I would consider running for mayor. This was Karen Lewis, the president of the Chicago Teachers Union. She had just had brain surgery. So as I visited with her on Labor Day, I said, Karen, what did they do to you when they operated in your brain? I said, have you lost your mind? Did they remove your mind? After we kind of went back and forth, uh, carrying on and uh, uh, making fun of each other, I decided that I would run for mayor. I decided that the run for mayor was important because Chicago needed a robust debate about its future. Too many coronations had taken place in the past. Only a select few interests were being addressed. The folks were, we've come to call the 1% in particular, and big money and machine politics were preventing a real democratic contest. We faced a critical urban crisis in education, uh, the uh, education in terms of deficits, privatization, and massive school closures. 50 schools were closed uh, three years ago in Chicago. Violence, especially among youth. Uh, 10,000 shootings over a four year span. We became the most violent city in the country. Unemployment and lack of development in Chicago neighborhoods was another salient issue. So the little known Cook County Commissioner, away from politics for 12 years, decided that he could make a difference, that he could become the voice of all those people who had ceased to believe in politics and in government in the city of Chicago. So I ran for mayor. And you might say, well, what was achieved besides having a famous mustache <laughs> six months later? Let me tell you. Uh, a few of the significant achievements that I think the campaign produced. It was the first mayoral runoff in city history. It forced 18 runoffs in the Chicago City Council, and I helped elect a handful of new independent and progressive aldermen to the Chicago City Council, including the first Latina in eight years in Chicago Council. And is that important to have Latinas on city council? Very important, right, Councilman? We had 
in the campaign an unprecedented seven televised debates, not including the debates that were not televised all over the city of Chicago. We built a multiracial, multiethnic, across faith coalition. We debated issues of the day, thereby making Chicago government and politics more transparent. Education, violence, minimum wage, housing, economic development. Since the runoff, most of my positions on those policy issues have been implemented by this mayor and this administration. As a matter of fact, last night, there was an announcement that one of the issues that I championed during the campaign, the creation of a trauma center on Chicago's South Side will become a reality at Holy Cross Hospital on Chicago's South and Southwest Sides. One more vindication, yes. So what was accomplished? In essence, we shook Chicago up, and I'm proud of that. We put Chicago on the map nationally and internationally. My family was getting calls from Mexico, from Guatemala, from South America, from Puerto Rico, from all over the Americas. We raised Latinos' community profile and elevated our rhetoric at a strategic moment. Why? There's an important election coming up next year, right? And we didn't ask anyone for permission. That's what democracy is all about. Thus, presidential candidates and other aspirants to the US Senate and offices all over the land will have to seek our votes more aggressively than ever before. As we celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month, simply want to say the following. Latinos are people whose essence comes from three key roots. Our indigenous presence on the continent, our European traits and everything that that brings to our essence, and of course our third root, our African root in the Americas. We possess roots, history, culture, faith, languages, it's more than Spanish, Portuguese, and the hundreds of native languages still spoken all over the Americas. And the experience that can make America great, North, South, Central, and the Caribbean. We should be mindful of the challenges, challenges our country faces, our connectedness to countries we or our foreparents came from, and we should strive to advance the cause of human dignity everywhere. We should also heed the calling of leaders like Pope Francis, and I assume not everyone here is Catholic, and I'm not the best Catholic in the room, I'm certain of that, Father Jesus, I must admit. <laughs> but Pope Francis, a world leader, reminds us that we have the responsibility of caring for the poor. We have the responsibility to become better stewards of our planet, yes, of Mother Earth. It's in the encyclical. And to build economies that distribute opportunity more equitably and that are sustainable. I believe that we are a unique force with a unique experience that can serve as a catalyst and a bridge that, can, that all Americans can come to appreciate so that all of us together work toward a more perfect union. Somos uno porque América es una. We are one because America is one. Long live Hispanic Heritage Month.